I think as was stated uh, just now, uh, regrettably, uh, the nuclear threats uh, are not at their low point. Uh, I think, frankly, uh, the issues, the, the possibility of a nuclear bomb going off are higher today than they were uh, 20 years ago, not in the massive U.S.-Soviet exchange that was, of course, the Cold War concern, but in terms of the various regional conflicts uh, that, that, uh, that we are facing. But that's another long story. I will, uh, I will um, um, uh, move ahead uh, to uh, uh, the assigned topic of maintaining the nuclear Iran agreement after I say a few words about Barbara. Uh, the, uh, uh, Barbara Lee, you, you heard it, but I want to reinforce it, somebody who has spent 10 years, basically, uh, uh, in, in the government, that, that she has been uh, a, a great uh, leader, both in the security and in the domestic uh, domains. Uh, she did just use a phrase, and I want to quote, taking out those who don't support this. Now, taking out is an ambiguous term. Uh, <laughs> it sounds like something that maybe some others would use, but I, I assume you mean electorally. Or electorally, <laughs> right, all right, very good. <laughs> yeah, good. Uh, the, uh, uh, but um, she also mentioned the 2004 Democratic Convention uh, here, and uh, that, of course, brings up John Kerry again, and I want to emphasize that John, uh, John and I, uh, of course, kind of, at, at the end, we basically co-negotiated the Iran agreement. But I also want to point out, uh, this is a little bit now of, you know, Boston bragging, uh, with John and me, Gina McCarthy, John Holdren, Brian Deese. We are talking about the Boston climate warriors. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, uh, that team was also very, very heavily uh, from uh, Boston, Boston writ broadly, Cambridge, et cetera. So, uh, so anyway, it was, a, it was a great time, and we got, I think we did get some, uh, some things done. Uh, so let me turn to the, um, no, I'm, I'm going to have one more aside. Uh, and this goes, to, again, to Barbara and her appropriations role. And the earlier question at the end of the last panel uh, about uh, the budget uh, balance or imbalance and uh, the threat to science and a, and a science career, I just want to say flat out, don't let something like this little blip uh, discourage you from a science career. Uh, for one thing, uh, just look at the budget that the Congress did this week. Frankly, none of the major proposals that I think caused a lot of us a lot of policy heartburn were put into that budget. Uh, in fact, if I look at the Department of Energy, for obvious reasons, uh, I got a lot of emails saying, looks like your budget. And it is very close to the budget we put forward. And a reason, one of the reasons is, I don't want to be Pollyannish, but the reality is support for the science agenda, for the innovation agenda. Yeah, there's noise, but fundamentally that is strong and that is bipartisan. I think Barbara would, would support that. Uh, so that's why you know, I do think there are elements of stability uh, that will uh, preserve a lot of these budget, budget priorities going forward. It does take work. I'm not going to say it doesn't take vigilance and work uh, because there are other voices. But, but I think uh, as long as we keep speaking, we keep acting, uh, there's, a, there's a very, very strong foundation uh, for, uh, for funding and supporting those kinds of priorities. Okay, finally, I will turn to the topic uh, I was given, um, uh, maintaining the Iran nuclear agreement. Uh, as was said, this was uh, certainly, uh, in, I think, uh, a, a, an important uh, an example of, of diplomacy reaching uh, critical security goals without a shot being fired. Uh, uh, I also want to put in a plug for science and diplomacy as something that was important uh, in, this, in, in this case. But you know, wh one can ask the question, and uh, many people here, uh, um, I, I don't want to insult anybody, but it would appear to be of my age group and probably do have a certain history, but there are a lot of young people as well. Uh, I just want to emphasize that the, uh, as one sees the, the, almost the difficulty of accepting the success of the agreement in many ways, one has to remember a very, very long, difficult history between Iran and the United States. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, regrettably, in a certain sense, uh, uh, we've lost a period uh, in which the United States was actually a hero to the Iranian uh, people. Uh, Harry Truman, President Truman, was recognized, for example, as explicitly uh, declining uh, to support, I'll be straightforward, British ideas of a coup uh, in, in, uh, with their first elected uh, leader in, in Iran. Unfortunately, in 1953, that changed, and the coup took place, uh, and uh, one has to remember that. Then, of course, we have to remember 1979, when Iran Iranians took over the U.S. Embassy. Americans died, not to mention hostage, a lot of hostages for a long time. Uh, then there was the Iran-Iraq War, where, uh, and I heard this a lot during the off hours of the negotiation, where the West bluntly stood by while chemical weapons uh, were used uh, against, uh, against Iran. Uh, in the 1990s, when I did serve in the Clinton administration, uh, it's not obviously so well known, but Iran was constantly on the agenda because of Russia-Iran collaboration, this is post-Soviet Union, Russia-Iran collaboration on nuclear issues. Uh, very complicated time, NATO expansion, we could go to Kosovo, we could go through all kinds of issues with the U.S. and Russia, but it spilled over into a block on our ability to move forward on important nuclear security issues with Russia because of the Iran dynamics uh, at that time. Uh, the, uh, then we go into the next century and we have the axis of evil. Uh, we have the 2003 Iraq war where Look, you know, Iranian-supplied IEDs did a lot of damage to American uh, personnel. Um, uh, and of course, today, we have Hezbollah, we have Syria, Yemen, Iraq, missiles, human rights. This is a complicated situation. <laughs> uh, and so all I'm saying is the grounds of distrust are very, very deep. And that has to be recognized uh, in going into this Iran agreement. It makes it even more remarkable in a certain sense that this agreement could then be, could then be accomplished with this background. But here now is where I want to emphasize what's very important, is that the decision was taken by President Obama very early in the administration, both to have a dialogue there had been some dialogue in the George W. Bush years. But to have a dialogue that did not start out with a whole set of preconditions, first and secondly, that was focused exclusively on the existential threat of nuclear weapons and did not in any way attempt <laughs> to solve at the same time all those other issues I talked about. That, by the way, is not particularly different from what President Reagan did uh, in the 1980s on arms control with the Soviet Union. It wasn't as though arms control was the only issue we had with the Soviet Union at the height of the Cold War. But the choice was made to address this existential threat. Much of the critique that you hear, if you listen carefully, about the Iran deal is not about the deal at all. It's about what the deal is not in addressing these other, these other issues. So I think that's, a, that's uh, uh, I, I think, an important kind of context uh, for, uh, for the discussion. So in a nutshell, what's the agreement? I think in this, in this audience, I'm sure many people are familiar, so I'll just be very high level. But the fundamental structure of the agreement is that the Iran nuclear program that was expanding very dramatically, 20,000 centrifuges, close to a reactor that would be one to two bombs worth of plutonium uh, per year, uh, et cetera, uh, advanced R&D program. So that program has both stopped and dramatically rolled back with major, it is not zeroed out, but it is rolled back very, very dramatically, important constraints on the program for 15 years. So that gets 15 years of, again, a, a highly restricted program. But then, and Barbara mentioned this, 
and it's not mentioned enough, and I really want to thank you for focusing on it, what is probably, I think, more important in the agreement are the extraordinary transparency and verification measures. Uh, uh, in, fact, in fact, in my list of that <laughs> difficult history between Iran and the United States, it's also between Iran and the international community in the sense that around 2003, Iran got caught, frankly, being outside the lanes on its nuclear program. Uh, and that is what ultimately led to the strong regime of sanctions and, and international collaboration. Okay, so the the again the grounds of, of distrust are 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 <laughs> unfortunately in many ways quite quite real. So the transparency measures, without strong transparency measures, there could not be an agreement. And in my view, quite appropriately. As a result, however, we have a whole bunch of unique features. For example. No one else has verification activities on the uranium supply chain. No one else has verification activities. I mean, this is like cameras and IA, IAEA inspectors on the manufacturing of key parts. Other countries do have the additional protocol, not all, but many. The additional protocol, for those not familiar with it, is the agreement with the International Atomic Energy Agency for them to have access to suspicious sites, not just sites that the country declares to be nuclear sites. That's very important, and Iran has agreed in perpetuity to be in the additional protocol. However, no other country has a fixed time in which to respond to that inspector request. And frankly, to use a technical term, there's a lot of rope-a-dope to just stretch out the response. With Iran, there's two weeks for the IAEA and them to resolve the issue, and if not, it automatically goes to a 10-day clock where there is access or there is a violation of the agreement. This is completely novel. Other countries, most countries, fortunately, unfortunately, a few not, most belong to the, to the Non-Proliferation Treaty. The Non-Proliferation Treaty says you won't have a nuclear weapon. It doesn't say that you will not engage in weaponization activities, the kinds of technical steps you would need to go quickly to a weapon. Iran has those constraints in this, uh, in this agreement. So this is, it, it's quite remarkable. Dick Garwin and other scientists wrote a letter to uh, President Obama in August of 2015 saying just that and saying, by the way, wouldn't it be great if we could get these kinds of measures to be part of the norm and apply, and apply much more broadly? So that's what the, what the agreement is. So now, maintaining. Obviously, as, uh, I think it was John who, who mentioned uh, that uh, a lot of noise in the system, despite the fact that the, quarterly required, the required quarterly report, report to Congress uh, recently did again affirm compliance uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the agreement. But ask the question, what happens if we do walk away? If the United States walks away from the agreement, then we get the worst of both worlds. Then Iran has no formal constraints. They, will, they may choose to continue to live under some of the constraints but probably not those unique verification measures. And we may say, okay, or some may say, some of her colleagues, who's particularly who mostly sit across the aisle, uh, uh, would say, okay, but we'll put, we'll put sanctions back on. And sanctions were biting. We can say that. It won't work. The reason it worked before was we, we had the entire international community, or the essential inter international community, on the same page, enforcing those sanctions. Not just those who negotiated the P5 plus one plus EU, but India, Japan, they were withholding oil revenues uh, from, uh, fr from Iran according to the sanctions. There is no reason to think 
that if we walk away, we don't walk away alone. Maybe one other country would be with us uh, from that negotiating group. But we're gonna walk away alone, fundamentally, and the sanctions will not, will not be effective. So many of those, including uh, many of those in Congress, and I would just mention, for example, Senator Corker, Chair of the Foreign Relations Committee in the Senate. Uh, he's explicitly said, look, I didn't support the deal, but now it's done. Now the important thing is we, we maintain compliance, agreement with the deal by all parties. That means us too. And so I can't say, you know, obviously I cannot say there's no doubt this deal will, will stick, will go forward, but I can say that the logic is completely clear and compelling and most people, including those who did not agree with the deal, have kind of, kind of come to that. So we will see what the administration, what the administration review uh, says, uh, but uh, I guess I am, let's say, reasonably optimistic that we will continue in this way and then I will put out one more challenge. And that's for all of us. And in that, which includes in, in my next, in my NTI role, this, this will be something that we will want to be looking at. Let's suppose we have success in terms of compliance with this agreement. We have got to think hard about what then, what do we want to see in Iran and elsewhere in the region and beyond in terms of nuclear fuel cycles? It would be crazy to keep doing our quarterly review and saying compliance, 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 and come to the end and not have a program, uh, which could include, for example, working on those transparency measures in the broader international context. So that to me is the agenda. Uh, we've got to be vigilant. We've got to try to sustain the agreement clearly, but we also need to think about what's the future that we want to see in this decadal time scale uh, as we as we come hopefully to the end of a, of a successful agreement. Thank you.